there's been a time for gathering the longhouse and sharing information around the fire. This is our contribution to that tradition. I was on the prod this morning and it cost me some footage of a couple of really nice wall hanger size bull elk. I was aware of the elk before they were aware of me, uh, but it was in a grove of aspen like this and I was having a hard time getting an angle for pictures or footage and uh, you know I had a plan and <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do and so I uh, you know kept angling for that that shot and base they, they ended up spooking before I ever got any kind of an angle on them and uh, if I had just relaxed my pacing they would have fed into me eventually anyway and I would have gotten some great footage. So that was a case of too much yang, not enough yin. And that's uh, kind of the subject of uh, today's lesson. It has to do with pacing. It has to do about with uh, how you think about the decisions that you make in the backcountry. Uh, essentially matching your energy to to what's going on um, and and you'll notice that uh, when animals move there's never a driving um, syncopated beat it's always a give and take a couple steps here a couple steps there do this do that um, and there's a reason for that they're matching their output to what it is they're trying to accomplish if you have pacing like that chances are you can move past animals who know you're there and they'll never spook because they recognize in your pacing an adaptation to the same environment they're in they see you as another wild animal and they simply don't spook uh, raptors birds of prey <laughs> they they always spook bears are so so but the ungulates uh, certainly you can move through them past them without them ever spooking uh, this sounds like a whole bunch of hippie mumbo jumbo. It's certainly true that uh, parts of it are non-cerebral. But there also is a very uh, cerebral analytical component to it that I'm going to go through. And uh, luckily, yesterday's yearling bear that we ran across, I didn't blow it. And uh, so we can look to him for a quick example of what I'm talking about. He's as interested in feeding, in foraging, and collecting energy as he is in how he outputs the energy. We, uh, we end up staying long enough that he considers our presence impolite, and he moves off. But when he does so, it's in a very uh, uh, a measured, smooth delivery of energy. And energy delivery is the cerebral way to think about what I'm talking about. So when you're in the backcountry, what are the things that give you energy? The first thing that you have to think about is whatever your baseline is. When you hit the trail, you're not likely at 100% uh, state. Did you drive overnight? Did you have a long week at work? You know, what were the aspects that gave you your baseline level? Uh, another thing that adds energy is food the quality and quantity of food that you're taking in adds energy to your endeavor. Recovery time is huge. This is why I'm so big on uh, having a good sleep system, having a comfortable sleep system, because if you're not getting your sleep, you don't get the recovery time you need in the backcountry. And then uh, morale. Morale is kind of an X factor. It's not, it doesn't take from your energy ledger or take or add to your energy ledger um, in a quantifiable way but there's a whole lot you can get done with morale there's a whole lot uh, of energy and power that it gives you you can't trade on it forever but uh, it's an X factor that is important uh, and then the other way to add energy has more to do with the preservation of energy um, how you travel now of course we're out here to travel we're going to spend energy traveling, but uh, the pace of our travel, uh, the line we take, our route selection, all of those things affect the amount of energy it takes to accomplish a given objective. Um, 
an artificial heat source can add energy. Um, you know, fire is a big one. I'm going to get a fire started, it's going to give me energy. Well, starting a fire actually takes a fair amount of energy. So, when you uh, start a fire, it's, it, it's a decision. It's an energy expenditure decision. Am I going to actually get more back from, from this activity than I put out? Uh, and then, of course, insulation. Um, insulation preserves your energy in the forms of, uh, of heat loss. So, uh, what removes energy from your body? Uh, as I said before, no, that is not a tick, thankfully. As I said before, um, movement is something that takes energy away. Of course you're going to move, it's the reason that you're out there, but being smart about that movement um, is going to uh, is going to be important. Um, and then heat loss. You've got four types of heat loss that are important to consider. And this basically goes to what your clothing system is going to be. Uh, first of all, radiant heat loss. That, that's simply, I'm sitting here, I'm cooling down, there's a temperature differential between my body and the outside air, and I'm radiating heat. That's costing me energy. Um, convective heat loss, wind. Uh, as I was talking here, the wind came up, and that's going to speed cooling. Uh, and that, that has a very significant factor on the clothing that you're wearing. It may not be that cold out, but if you have the wind blowing, which is frequently the case in the mountains, um, that's going to speed cooling. Uh, conductive heat loss. I'm sitting on the ground. If this was a, a cold winter day, I would literally be having heat sucked through my body into the ground. Uh, and then evaporative heat loss. Uh, and that has to do with um, sweat is how humans cool themselves. So if you're wet, if you're sweaty, um, you lose heat loss, th you lose heat through, through um, the cooling of the water on your skin. And so managing moisture is a big part of minimizing that heat loss as well. Um, so the whole point here on the cerebral side of things is thinking in terms of an energy ledger. Everything that you're doing is either adding to or taking away energy or some combination thereof. And what at first glance might seem like um, a real obvious, oh, that's giving me energy or, oh, that's taking away energy, maybe not. Uh, here's an example. Travel light, freeze at light, freeze at night. Everybody's heard this. Um, you don't carry a lot of gear. You get down the trail easier. That's less energy expenditure. But then you freeze at night. Um, Remember how recovery is important? So the question is, when you're freezing at night, is that a, um, that's obviously a loss, but the question is, in choosing to carry less gear, did you save energy overall, or did you expend energy overall? Was that a good decision or bad? There's no right answer. And in fact, every circumstance, there's gonna be a different answer. It's always an ebb and flow of, of what makes the most sense there. But that's an example of an energy, um, energy ledger decision process that you need to think through as you're selecting gear, as you're choosing routes, as you're traveling through the backcountry. And why is it that energy um, ledger is so important? Well, first of all, traveling efficiently, traveling elegantly is, is always the goal, and that kind of circles back to what I was talking about at the beginning with, with your pacing and how the animals respond to you, if that matters to you. Uh, but the other thing is, I don't believe that there are any accidents in the backcountry. Well, maybe I'll say very, very few accidents. Oh, this just happened. No, that was the result of cascading bad decisions that probably started before you even got out on the trail. Um, you know, you, you pushed yourself all week at work. You decided, well, I'm going to drive straight through to get to the trailhead that night. And so you are already starting behind the curve. Uh, and then you pushed yourself harder on the trail than you should have, making you prone to stumbling. And, oh, I, I, I just slipped and broke my leg. Well, no, you didn't. You made a decision to um, push yourself harder than you should have in the given circumstance. And, and you ended up um, slipping as the result of it. And, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's how you want to go through, uh, go through your backcountry adventures. But... Remember that that, um, that hospital is not right around the corner. Most of what we do is uh, outside of the golden hour of emergency care. And uh, if you, if you want to come back alive, you need to think like you don't have a safety net. Because you don't. 
the safety net there's more of a safety net now than probably there's ever been but even where I'm sitting here now I'm only an hour and a half probably into my hike um, and search and rescue is not really that far away but if I pull out my Delorme inReach and hit the beacon um, it's going to be it's probably going to be four or five hours before anybody shows up and boy that's that's on the low side and there's a little bit of rain blowing in I'm getting sprinkled on let's say that I didn't have my raincoat which of course I do uh, I could I could suddenly be in a critical situation out here on just a, a very casual little hike and um, most of our outdoor endeavors are like that even if we choose not to recognize it so if you take that well, you know, that gym mentality out into the backcountry, it can get you into trouble very quickly uh, because this is not a gym. You know, there's not somebody who can notice there's a problem and, and call emergency services, which are going to be, the, be there within 15 minutes. This is a different environment. And you may get by for years having that wrong mentality, but eventually you're not going to be able to cheat them out and something's going to go wrong. Um, so so this is a short lesson it's it's not so much about things as it is thought process as it is how to evaluate how to integrate but it's probably the most important aspect to to what I'll ever talk about when it comes to backcountry travel